Thank you so much, all, all of you, for being here. I'm Susan Benny, Executive Director of the ABAA. Thank you for joining us for the Tickner Society's Collectors Roundtable, <clears throat> which is part of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America's Boston Virtual Book Fair. We hope you will visit the fair at abaa.org slash VBF if you have not already. The fair runs until 7 p.m. Eastern time today. Just a couple of notes. We are recording this session for later viewing. Also, if you have any comments or questions, we ask that you write them in the chat and we will try to answer them. There will also be a Q&A time at the end of the session. The Tickner Society sponsors an annual roundtable of collectors at the Boston Book Fair and it is maintaining that tradition this year. Participants include Heather O'Donnell, founder of Honey and Wax Booksellers in Brooklyn, Erica Hapke, Burnett Panker Rare Books of Boston, and Peter X. Accardo, Programs and Public Service Librarian at the Houghton Library. It's our pleasure to welcome the panelists and moderator. Mary Warnament is Head of Reader Services at the Boston Athenaeum with a Master's in Library and Information Science from Simmons University. She has a Master's in Medieval Studies from the University of Toronto and her personal and research interests focus on the 15th century. She is in her second year as president of the Tickner Society and looks forward to welcoming, welcoming you all to events online for now. Heather O'Donnell of Honey and Wax Booksellers in Brooklyn, New York, draws on her experience in research libraries in the rare book trade and specializes in unusual and unique copies of literary classics with an emphasis on association copies. Heather founded the Brooklyn-based rare book firm Honey and Wax Booksellers in 2011 after an early academic career. She has a PhD from Yale and also attended the Princeton Society of Fellows for Undergraduate and seven years in the New York Gallery of Bowman Rare Books. In 2016, she co-founded the Women's Initiative of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, an outreach effort designed to support women rare booksellers. The following year, she and Rebecca Romney established the annual Honey and Wax Book Collecting Prize of $1,000 for a young woman book collector. Heather is featured in The Booksellers, the 2019 documentary on the New York book trade. She serves on the ABAA Board of Governors, the Faculty of the Antiquarian Book Seminar, and the Yale Library Associates Trustees. Erica Hapke began her career in the rare book trade in 2011, working a few hours a week in the shipping department of Burnett Pinker Rare Books, then called F.A. Burnett. In 2013, she was asked to join the team full-time as the office manager. Her career as a book collector and antique dealer, however, began at a much earlier age. Erica's favorite childhood summer days were spent wandering local flea markets and garage sales with her family. In high school, she joined the online retail site Etsy to offer for sale some of the vintage treasures she so enjoyed hunting for. Erica has l run LaRue Vintage both online and at local pop-up markets since 2008. She graduated from the Massachusetts College of, Arts, of Art and Design with a dual degree in animation and art history in 2010 and she attended a rare book school course in Virginia in 2015. She is currently building two book collections, one focused on mid-century illustrated children's books about cats, fitting because it's Catter Day, the other an archive of published and printed ephemera dealing with early social and business history of her hometown of New Milford, Connecticut. Peter X. Accardo has been a member of the Houghton Library staff since 1985. He began his career as a bibliographic assistant responsible for reporting library holdings to ESTC. In 1986, he accessioned books printed between the 16th and 20th centuries in the bequest of Philip Hofer, the library's founding curator of the Department of Printing and Graphic Arts. An acquisitions bibliographer, he assisted the curator of rare books in identifying and acquiring new material for the library. In the technical services department, he took on cataloging, 
and project management roles. He currently serves as Houghton's scholarly and public programs librarian, reporting to Anne Marie as Director of Scholarly and Public Programs. As of October 2020, he is the interim Philip Hofer Curator of Printing and Graphic Arts. In addition to his regular duties, he serves as an adjunct in, public, in the Public Services Division with teaching and reading rooms assignments. He has curated major exhibitions on Byron, Ruskin, and Arthur Conan Doyle and acted as a staff advisor on the physical and online exhibition, Boston's Crusade Against Slavery, curated by Harvard professor John Stauffer and his students. Accardo has published on subjects relating to historical bibliography. His current projects include a history of the treasure room in the Widener Library and the first biography of the American Sherlockian H.W. Bell. A native Bostonian, he dates his personal collection from the third Burt Boston International Antiquarian Book Show. Since then, he has formed collections on the poets Lord Byron and Rupert Brooke, George Tickner, and H.W. Bell. He also maintains a large collection on the history of the book and the history of the Harvard College Library. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, as president of this book-loving group, I'm excited to kick off our event by announcing the 2020 winner of the second annual George and Anna Elliott Tickner Collecting Prize. The deadline was in April, and given uh, the unexpected circumstances this year, we were very pleased to receive so many excellent submissions. Uh, the selection committee, in, among all the tough choices, chose Maida Tilchins in celebration of New Mexico books and book people as the prize winner. Uh, I wish I could ask her to stand up, um, but maybe during this event you'll see uh, her listed among the participants. We're arranging an online event in 2021 for Maida to discuss how she began her collection, and uh, we hope you'll join us. You'll see this listed among events on tickner.org, or if you're a member, in our monthly newsletter. Membership is quite reasonably priced. You can go to tickner.org to sign up. We'll have another prize competition for New England collectors in the spring. You need not be a member in order to apply. And uh, we hope you consider doing so and encouraging someone in your life uh, to do so as well. Our round table, our three panelists are going to speak in turn uh, and we'll finish with the Q&A. As Susan mentioned, you can put your questions in the chat at any time so you don't forget them and uh, we'll get to them then. Um, we're gonna start off with Heather O'Donnell, move on to Erica Hapke and end up with Peter Ricardo. And uh, I'm gonna pose just a question that they can all talk about amongst their different um, individual topics. How did you get started in the book world? Um, well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back at the Ticknor Society uh, Collectors Roundtable. Uh, I got involved in the book world. Um, I guess the, the first formal entrance into it was uh, when I was in college and I worked at the Strand. Um, you know, that was where I first uh, saw people sorting books and learned a little bit about the trade. And then I also in college and also in grad school worked in libraries, uh, the Avery Library at Columbia and then the Beinecke Library at Yale. So uh, in both uh, those places, I learned a lot about what it means to, uh, to collect and conserve in an institutional way. Uh, so that would be my answer to how I got started. <laughs> um, and I am uh, really happy to be here today uh the last time i was on this round table i talked about my own collections but today i'm going to talk um, more broadly from a dealer's perspective about the kind of collecting that uh, i've been seeing and that seems to be uh where the market at present is taking us and that is really reflected in the offerings at uh the book fair this weekend um, which those of you who have been been visiting and shopping there will have seen um and so uh when erica invited me to do this. She mentioned a, a brief clip in the booksellers where uh, Rebecca Romney and I are, are talking about how we've noticed that uh, people are turning more and more to very individual, very unique items, ephemera, vernacular photography, manuscripts, um, as opposed to printed first editions as the subject of their collections. 
And, uh, and Erica asked if I would say more about that. Uh, and so I will. Um, there's a good reason why the sort of high spot model of first edition book collecting um, is a challenging one right now. And uh, there include the, the post-war boom in institutional collecting, um, but really the big, the big driver of the whole thing has been the internet. The fact that it used to be possible to imagine yourself having a great collection of first editions and not having to be enormously wealthy to get it. Imagining the scenario in which you walk into a bookshop and with your superior knowledge, you notice something that's neglected on the shelf and are able to get it for not that much money because you really know what you're looking for. Part of what the internet did to book selling is that it made it possible for even very untalented and indifferent booksellers to, by using Google, access the much better research capacities of, of serious booksellers and price their books accordingly. So that um, in you know, 1980, you might've walked into a shop and found a first edition of Edith Wharton without her name in it, her first book, not, not under the name Edith Wharton. Um, you might've been able to just find it and know what it was and get it and have a prize. Um, now, anyone who gets that book will probably plug it in and will see, oh, that's a really valuable book and maybe plagiarize the description too, not to be too harsh, but you know, you know what I'm saying, that there is now an enormous amount of information online about these things. You don't actually have to know very much about the material to have a sense of what it might cost. And the result of that has been uh, that the value of important first editions has kind of gone through the roof and has also stabilized at like a particular level. It's very hard to find bargains in the way that it was before the internet. It's not that you can never find them, but it, it would be hard. I mean, if, if I were not someone with an enormous amount of disposable income, I would say, you know, to be like a Hemingway first edition completist, like if you're committed to that, at some point you're gonna have to put down six figures for a book, like to do that probably. Um, unless you get really, really lucky and you know you just find it at a garage sale or something. Um, part of, of this general trend in the way the books are priced um, has been to turn off a lot of people from pursuing collections that uh, that they don't feel they can they can ever complete in the way that they had understood book collecting to be. And what's been exciting, I think, and what continues to really interest me as a bookseller, are the ways that people are coming up with different ways to collect that get around this particular problem. And one of the natural responses to that kind of um, movement in a market is to look for stuff that doesn't have comparables, where nobody else has the same thing, or it's very unlikely that they have the same thing. So you're not gonna be coming up against that, uh, that wall of, of history in that way. And uh, so one thing that we've definitely seen in the trade, in the Honey and Wax book collecting prize that, that I judge, um, is people really passionately committing to unique ephemeral objects and items, vernacular photography, band flyers, zines, all kinds of things that um, don't look like what we might imagine a typical you know, rare book gentleman's library to look like, but that are actually really fascinating and have a lot of historical kind of aura to them. And that can be picked up for not that much money if you know where to look and you know what you're looking for. Um, it's been exciting to see that material really kind of come into its own. Uh, and so one thing that I have really enjoyed at the fair this weekend has been the appearance of a number of dealers who are quite new to the ABA and to iLab who are bringing this kind of material. Um, I, so I just, I'm just made a few notes of some things I thought were really uh, interesting. Uh, the Daniel Oliver Gallery, who is, I uh, just got into the ABA last month, um, a, uh, a gallery in Brooklyn has uh, a really fascinating photo and manuscript archive of the experience of a Massachusetts nurse during the Spanish Civil War. Um, you know, just a really interesting visual and also historical um, sort of tour through the experience of someone who never published a book about it. You know, you can't buy the book, but you can, you can take a look at this little archive and learn something about the experience of a Yankee during that war, um, you know, in the, in the medical field. 
Um, I was also really interested to see Stacey Waldman from House of Mirth. And this is, I think, the second or third year that uh, she's been a part of the ABA. Uh, this sold, but I thought it was really fantastic, was uh, an African-American child's, looks like a scrapbook or a school project from the 1970s um, about the Black history, starting with slavery, but then and then focusing on the present, which is pretty much Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Arthur Ashe, like the great, um, great sort of sports triumphs in the 1970s, but then looking to the future with the idea, with a picture of the Capitol, which of course, you know, has come to pass, uh, and also the $10 bill. This year, we might actually see the Tubman 20. Um, so it was exciting to see that, that playing out. Um, and then a European dealer, he's actually American, but operates in Europe, uh, Daniel Morgan from Morgan Books with iLab is in the fair for the first time. Um, and he does Czech and Eastern European material. But I just thought this is again sold, but I thought it was really interesting was a, um, a Czech book design, binding design for the Bible, but using the sort of radical um, avant-garde visual traditions of, of the uh, Czech modernist period, a kind of cubist take on a, a biblical binding, which I just thought was so like a wonderful way to bring together a very classic area of book collecting and then, you know, a, a, an avant-garde sort of uh, tradition from the from Eastern Europe. So I thought that was that was really fun. Um, and I haven't had a chance to go through everything in this fair, as I'm sure many others feel like I keep going in and doing deep dives, but then I come out and I realize that I still haven't seen half the booths. So I'm going to go back in after this and take a look. But I think the the appeal of um, this kind of uh, material, you know, is is that it does offer entry points for lots of collectors who otherwise might feel themselves somewhat excluded from what we've traditionally thought of as the rare book world. Um, and it's also the kind of thing that can be extremely local. There's paper being generated all over the place, everywhere, about everything. Um, you know, I could walk around this neighborhood right now and make a great collection of closed for COVID-19, but here's our policy, you know, flyers, which to be real, would have more ultimate value <laughs> historically than me just like, you know, emptying out my bank account to buy one more copy of Dickens or whatever. So, you know, that you have an opportunity to uh, to put together stuff that's that's local to you and interesting to you. And I would love to see that kind of collecting um, celebrated and embraced. And so I'm excited to see that that's part of what's happening at the Boston Fair this year. And I'll leave now to Erica. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Um, Mary, thank you for moderating today. I'm so pleased to join Heather and Peter for this discussion. Um, to answer your question originally, how did I get started in this world? Um, I was first introduced to Burnett Pinka, where I work, uh, because they placed an ad seeking help in their shipping department with my alma mater, Mass College of Art and Design. And at the time, I had just been running my own vintage shop for a few years. And the crossover between the work that I was doing in my own shop and the tasks that this open position were looking for, they overlapped really beautifully. And I was very lucky that they felt the same way that I did. And I've been with them ever since. So I'm very excited to talk about my very local, somewhat ephemeral collection that I'm working on. Um, for the past few years, I have been building a collection it's a little less than half published books, a little less than half ephemeral paper items, and then a smattering of objects. And I'm building a collection surrounding the history of my hometown of New Milford, Connecticut. Um, it first began with uh, Howard Peck's New Milford. This is a book that I was reading for pleasure. Um, Howard Peck was the town clerk for over 30 years in New Milford. It's a conversational memoir of the town. It's not a proper history, but a collection of stories that make up the town. I was inspired by that approach because it describes the town almost as a living thing. I think it's a fairly, it's a fairly straightforward process to compile a history of a town, making a list of names and dates and, and titles, but um, I was fascinated not so much with the names and dates, 
but the stories that make a community unique from any other community. So this inspired the collection. My research Bible in this process has been the history of New Milford and Bridgewater, Connecticut, 1703 to 1882. As you can see, I, I sticky note as pieces of information become relevant in my collection. This is the, the list of names and dates. So this has been my greatest reference. Um, New Milford has long been a home to artists. So a good portion of my collection includes published books uh, that are portfolios of artwork focused on artists who live and use New Milford as subject matter. So for example, the New Milford portfolio showcases uh, watercolors and block prints by Waldemar Newfield. Um, I also collect magazines and newspapers that feature artwork and articles about New Milford. So here's a copy of the Saturday Evening Post from 1953 and the cover features a painting of the New Milford town green. It's a, a tiny little excerpt inside there where the the artist mentions stumbling across this charming town on their way to New York and being so inspired they had to come back and paint it. It's very sweet. Um, I am particularly drawn to local publications because they include so many small details that a widely published piece wouldn't have. So a small example of that are, this is a family cookbook that was compiled in the 1960s by one of the local churches. It's an incredible supplemental research piece because in it you you get the names of who was really active in the community at that time and you notice a lot of familiar last names as you dig into the history of the town. Um, something a little less charming but equally fascinating is um, Western Connecticut's Great Flood of 1955. This was a, a horrifically damaging flood that occurred in uh, Western Connecticut and the publication brought together all of these news photographs of the disaster from the surrounding towns. And I think it's a great reference because these are the types of images that might have otherwise just sat in a newsroom's archives. Someone had the foresight to put them together. Um, let's see. This is a booklet that was published to celebrate the 250th anniversary of New Milford. So this was made in 1957. And what I what I've noticed about local publications that is the most helpful in researching is the advertisements. So for example, when you were getting ready to publish a piece to celebrate an event, you would have to go around town as you do now and uh, solicit donations for your publication, either for the event or for the book, the actual printing costs. So these are almost little time capsules of what businesses were in business at the time. They, they include fascinating little tidbits of information that you wouldn't just find listed in a record. They note who the current owner is. They have the original telephone numbers and the address. Many of them actually mention uh, who, they, um, who their predecessing businesses were, which is fascinating. So my favorite part about local publications are the not necessarily why they were published, but those extra things. So this is the 250th anniversary. Its counterpart is the 300th anniversary publication, which was just made in 2007. Um, I'd like to share a little story that for me kind of summarizes the wonder of discovery that I find so enjoyable about building this collection. I was flipping through this. I just acquired it a few months ago and I was reading some articles about the tobacco industry, which was the main industry of New Milford at the turn of the century. And then I came across this article, including this image, which is the Hungerford Warehouse in downtown New Milford. And it shows the owners, a number of employees, it has their names, the dates. And I was really stopped in my tracks when I saw that. When I was 14 or 15, I went to a tag sale at an elderly neighbor's house and picked up a few boxes of old papers and photographs. Uh, at the time I was doing collage art. I just thought old photos were cool. He couldn't tell me much about them except that he thought they were from New Milford. He thought they were pretty old. For years, I had been bringing with me to each apartment I lived in this photograph, not knowing what it was or who was in it or when it was from. And it turns out it was the Hungerford Warehouse 
and this gentleman is the owner, and I now had the names and dates and the full context of what this image was. It's not just a, a cool Sepia photo, it's a piece of New Milford history. Um, to have that context just kind of fall into my lap so many years later was so exciting because for me, book collecting is like trying to complete a jigsaw puzzle while also simultaneously trying to sew a quilt from scratch. The pieces exist and finding them is this wonderful treasure hunt, but at the same time, the scope of the image you're trying to create is totally unique. So the insight I might get from the stories of the town is gonna to be totally different than the insight anyone else would have gotten because they're using different sources, they're approaching it from a different place than I am. They're gonna be able to make different connections. Um, my collection includes a lot of pieces of ephemera, um, very traditional things like postcards, uh, advertisement cards. This is a turn of the century washing machine advertisement that was put out by Anthony and McMahon of New Milford. I was delighted to find at a book fair recently a stereoscopic view card of an old sawmill stream in New Milford right around 1900. And collecting these pieces got me interested in correspondence, original correspondence. This has been really eye-opening for me because there are all these adjacent worlds to book collecting that I have only just begun to learn about. There are, for example, very serious collectors of stamps, as we know. And there are people who are very serious collectors of stamp markings, the actual postal markings that go through correspondence. And I knew nothing about this world, but I found that those people who collect and sell, sell letters that are from all over the world, including New Milford. So for a collector of stamps, they might list a particular envelope or letter and not mention anything about what the contents are. But for someone like me, who's compiling a history, the contents are, are everything. So I picked up a letter that I was very excited because it is um, a fairly important person in New Milford history, Caroline Boardman. Uh, her family was one of the founding families of New Milford. She was something of a socialite at the time. This is from 1825 on the occasion of her marriage to a well-known reverend. It's very gossipy and talking about who's gonna be her bridesmaids and who absolutely cannot be her bridesmaid because it would be a scandal. Um, and it's this wonderful, just friendly moment. A few years later, I picked up another random letter and it happens to be from her youngest son to her elder son on the occasion of her husband's death. And it is um, a pretty straightforward letter. It's talking about family plans and travel plans. And I found in the envelope written in pencil in very small, the same handwriting as the letter, a note that says, do you know everything to make it better? And it was this very profound moment for me because it was, I believe, and I don't know this for certain, but I believe it was a younger, a younger brother asking his older brother who had gone on to be a reverend like their father for spiritual guidance in dealing with the death of their father. To hold these two letters and see the journey of this family from, from its inception to the end of one of its members felt really meaningful to me because here's this, this very human story that takes these townspeople who were otherwise just names and dates in the ledger and it gives them humanity. It gives them feelings and triumphs and sorrows. And that's very much what I'm interested in building this collection. So a few other fun things. I've recently acquired a ribbon and medal from the New Milford Bicentennial in 1907, which is a lot of fun because as I find photos of that event, you can see if you look very close, um, these same medals on the outfits of the committee. Strangest thing I have in my collection is probably this framed carpet remnant. Uh, this is from the Knapp family house, one of the other founding families of New Milford in the late 1800s. I think when the rug uh, became so disrepaired it couldn't be fixed, the New Milford Historic Society decided to, rather than throw it away, to sell fragments of it, uh, which is a wonderful way to preserve a piece of textile history. So summarize. Uh, 
I was warned as I got ready for my first book fair, which was the Boston Book Fair, um, that it was next to impossible to spend time around so many fantastic books and not catch the book collecting bug. And I went in convinced that that would never happen to me because I had this impression that book collecting was only for people with significant financial means. It was only for people who had beautiful libraries to display their books. It was only for esteemed academics and scholars. And what I learned was there's actually a million different facets to this world, that there are so many different ways to be a book collector. Um, I learned that it's not the dollar value of your collection that makes it worthwhile or not. What makes a collection important is the story it tells. And the beautiful thing is that everyone has a story they want to tell. So thank you. That's great. I want to thank the Tickner Society, particularly Dale, Dale Stinchcomb and the ABAA for inviting me to join you this afternoon to tell you a little bit about my collecting of Byron over the years. I th I'd have to say I've been a bibliophile as long as I can remember. And it began at a book sale uh, that our local town library in Winchester, Mass, where I grew up, uh, sponsored each year. I remember one time when I was about eight or nine, uh, getting for myself a 12 volume history of the United States. And it was a much longer walk home that evening than usual. Um, I, my having to stop every few blocks to rest my tired arms. I didn't actually start collecting Byron though until I was in high school, very modestly at first. I'm fortunate to grow up here in Boston where there were so many great used and secondhand bookstores to support that interest. Brattle Bookshop, uh, Goodspeeds, uh, so many others, uh, Pangloss in Cambridge, Doug Harding up in Maine, and many other towns that supported the book trade at the time. And so I'm very grateful uh, for allowing for them allowing me into their stores and for supporting that interest that I had uh, earlier in my lifetime. Uh, what I'd like to do is share with you a few objects that I have ranged around me here at home uh, that try to document uh, a particular aspect of my collecting, which focuses on Byron and his influence in this country. And I'd like to begin with a little book here. This is uh, the first American edition of the Jower which is a poem that Byron wrote. It came out in Boston in 1813. And at the time it had a very agreeable price point, about $25, and they still do for the most part. Uh, and yet it kind of suffered, I think, when compared to its English counterpart. And it really wasn't until I started working at the Houghton Library where my mentor, Roger Stoddard, had pointed out that if I looked at this kind of book in the aggregate, um, that there might be some interesting story to tell. And as a general rule of thumb, I think uh, less important are these books to me as objects on my shelves than they are as vehicles for scholarly storytelling. And so I'll try in the little time that I have here today to do a little bit of that. Uh, here's a small Boston edition of a Byron work called Hebrew Melodies. It was the last book that I purchased from George Goodspeed. Uh, George was a, a kind of an institution in Boston for many years, kind of the quintessential Yankee bookman. And after he left his Beacon Street address up on Beacon Hill, he moved across the street and occupied a suite of rooms that many years before had been the library of none other than George Tickner. Uh, Tickner is a bibliographical hero of mine, and he also uh, is an author that I collect. And I think in honor of um, Catter Day, I wanted to share with you this. This is a little poem that Tickner had translated from the Spanish that he called the two scrupulous cats. It was undoubtedly done for an autograph collector. Tickner also happened to be one of the few Americans that actually knew Byron. And it's from Tickner that we learned that Byron was very much aware of his transatlantic fame and that he was also aware of these little American editions uh, that I've dedicated a good part of my life collecting. But Tickner wasn't the only American interested in in Byron and the things that interested him. Uh, you may know the name Samuel Gridley Howe as the founder of the Perkins School uh, for the Blind. Um, but early in his lifetime, he was a surgeon. And like Byron, who made his way to Greece, ultimately dying in the cause of Greek independence, Howe made his way to Greece as well and served there for a few years. And at a sale of Byron's possessions that he attended on the island of Poros, he came away with Byron's ceremonial war helmet that you can see in this illustration, 
on the dust jacket of a book by his daughter, Maud Howe Elliott. Um, I want you to take a look at that closely. This is a copy of the book that was owned by Elliott's husband. And laid inside of it is an unpublished photograph of the actual helmet that wasn't used in the book, although there are other pictures uh, in the book that were taken at a studio in Athens. It's a great read and it documents her travels across Europe on the Orient Express, finally ending up in Athens, where she presented the helmet to the cultural museum there, which you can, where you can see it to this day. Um, another fellow that was interested in Byron was a missionary named Charles Samuel Stewart. Now Stewart had made the acquaintance of the seventh Lord Byron, Byron's successor, while they were both out in the Hawaiian Islands. And he had secured a promise at that time that if he ever visited London, that he would make his way to visit the seventh Lord, which he ultimately did. And the reason why this is important to me is that I had always hoped as a collector of limited means to own at least a fragment of Byron's handwriting. That fragment appeared uh, courtesy of the Goodspeed's bookshop. Claire Rochefort, who used to run the manuscripts division there, offered it to me. And again, it was very reasonably priced uh, for a manuscript of Byron's at that time. You can see the top line where he writes, cold is the heart, fair grease. And below it, there's a note of authentication in the hand of um, Byron's sister. Maybe you can make it out that way. And I would have been very content with that as the, like the one fragment in Byron's hand um, that I could say I had in my collection. But it happened just a few years later that the next four lines from the same stanza of Child Harold Pilgrimage came up in the marketplace. So now I think of, I have a controlling interest in this one stanza of this one Byron poem. But as important to me, uh, the, the, the fragments are, is this letter that accompanied the second fragment. And this letter was written by Stuart uh, from Newstead Abbey, actually from the poet's own bedroom. Newstead was the ancestral home of the Byron family. And if I may, I'd like to just read a little bit of this letter to you, which makes it self-explanatory. He writes to an autograph collecting friend in Washington, uh, Dear Madam, I recollect when in Washington last winter to have promised to secure an autograph of Byron for your collection, if in my power. I wish to pre I, I presented this wish to Lord Byron and seeing if he could secure one, uh, if he had any willing, that he was willing to spare, thinking there might be many still in his possession. And I was quite surprised on my unexpected visit to England to learn from him that with the exception of one poem in manuscript, there was but a single scrap of his handwriting in the whole family and that the Honorable Miss Byron, the poet's daughter was the possessor. But I have the satisfaction today that now it has the honor of being transferred, Madame, to you. So you have this impeccable provenance based on this letter written in Byron's own bedroom, where in fact the table that he wrote the poem on still, still stood. Stuart then went on to write a history or an account of his travels in Europe or in Great Britain and Ireland, I should say. And he repeats that story in this book too. So I mention all of this because for me, collecting has always been a vehicle for storytelling and scholarship. Uh, again, I'm very grateful to the bookmen and women who I've gotten to know over the years, who allowed me time in their stores, who looked after my interests and taught me a lot. And so uh, let me conclude my remarks with that uh, and say once again, how grateful I am to all of you for finding time this afternoon uh, to hear a little bit about my collecting. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to start the Q&A section now. Uh, you can either place your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. We have one already, and this one is directed at Erica. This is from Ronald Epp. Erica, given your concentration on a particular community, have you expanded your range to include adjacent communities where there might be overlap? Actually, something I, I work very hard to limit myself because the temptation to start collecting any of the local towns and, and indeed we have a number of, um, <clears throat> I'm not even sure what the official name for it is, neighborhoods that are technically part of New Milford, but they have their own um, go 
government uh, figureheads and whatnot. So, you know, Mariel and, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so for example, I, I mentioned my Bible includes Bridgewater. Um, Bridgewater and New Milford are adjacent. Northville is an offshoot of New Milford. I do occasionally download them, but I try and limit it only to uh, materials that also explicitly mention New Milford because otherwise I could, I could truly go nuts and, and <laughs> fill this entire wall with, with writings about nearby towns. I'm, it's, a, it's tempting, it's tempting. Okay, any other questions for our collectors today? Ah, here's one. This is a more general question. Do you think ephemera collecting runs the risk of things being gathered but sidestepping history? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Which of you would like to take this one? Um, I'll take it. Uh, you know, I think that ephemera collecting, like all collecting, it can be done in a disciplined uh, and, you know, committed and historically informed way, or can be done in a random kind of, um, you know, capricious way. And of course, there's no policing anyone's collecting. I guess, I guess you can police institutional collecting, but private collecting is really just like the Wild West and you can do whatever you like along any lines that you, that you like. You know, I, I think that the collections that are of most interest are those where someone does, even if they didn't have it at the, when they started the collection, eventually develops a historical sense about what they're looking at and is able to bring that to bear on how they structure the collection and the kind of materials that they see talking within it. I mean, certainly I think that most university librarians who I talk to are really, um, familiar with and committed to bringing a strong historical perspective to the various materials that, that come through. So I don't think that there's, um, you know, I, I, I think it's really important. And I think it's a part, a lot of these ephemeral materials are a part of the historical record produced by people who didn't write books as much. And so it's really important to try to get that material preserved. Thank you. Uh, for the panelists, what are, are your plans for bequeathing or selling your collections? Nobody, collectors don't get rid of their collections. <laughs> Not right away at least. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Erica. I, I hope to continue building this collection through my lifetime. Um, but my, my hope is that as I if at the end of my life, the New Milford Historical Society is still um, flourishing as they are now, I would love for anything of interest to them to be housed with them. Two questions for Peter. Uh, question number one, why Byron? And question number two, did you come across anything related to Ada Loveless while collecting Byron? Well, thank you for those. Um, this is a story I've told often, but I can't assume that I've said it to all of you, but I'll repeat it here. When I was in high school, I had fallen asleep in a poetry class. My punishment was to choose a poem from the anthology we were using, and then to teach that poem the following day, like Monday. And so when the anthology was held in front of me, I saw a poem called The Destruction of Simnacarib. It sounded like a poem that a, like a young uh, man might enjoy reading. And that weekend, I bought a paperback of Byron's poetry, read about a figure that just totally blew away any conception I had of what a life of a poet might have been. And, you know, started from that. So a very offbeat way to get in interested. And then, you know, I saw that he was a part of an age that I still find very interesting. This was an age that produced Napoleon and Beethoven. And Byron himself was a world figure. You know, every country he traveled through, he left some some, you know, some record of his being there. And I think that's witnessed today by the proliferation of international Byron societies. I should say that if any of you are interested in learning more about Byron, you might go to the Byron Society of America webpage. It's a great first place to go to learn about Byron. Um, and 
you know, it's uh, the second question again. Can you remind me? Sure. Um, Ada Loveless, have you come across anything in, in your searches? Sure. I think slowly Byron's becoming better known as the father of Ada Lovelace than the other way around. Ada is a remarkable figure uh, and, and certainly because of her association with Charles Babbage. She's considered a pioneer of women, a woman in STEM, uh, considered an early computer programmer in that regard. Uh, as far as my own collecting is concerned, I don't have anything directly related to her, um, but her face as a child appears in certain editions of the third canto of Charles Darrell's Pilgrimage. And I do have in my collection a, a cartoon done uh, satirizing Byron's divorce from Lady Byron. And in that cartoon, you see Lady Byron off to the side clutching a little girl. Uh, that would be Ada Byron. But that's pretty much all I have directly that relates to her. Thank you. What are the best sources you have found to in your searches for things for your collections? So I, I think this means like garage sales, bookstores, auction. I think all of those uh, avenues are good ones. Um, things have certainly changed in my time as a collector, where before it was that serendipity where you go into a roadside antique shop and you would find something that way. And not always valuable things too. And I, I should say that I do collect a canonical author, um, but I do enjoy just as much, you know, finding little cabinet cards and things that were produced for teaching purposes and usually in out of the way places. The internet too, of course, has become a great source of filling gaps and also discovering new kinds of things to collect things that might otherwise not have made a book stall, say at the Boston Antiquarian Book Fair. So I think that that's a really attractive aspect to the new ways of collecting today that the internet affords. I'd also say that social media has really, particularly Instagram, has really taken off as a way of making people more widely aware of certain kinds of material that they might not, you know, they might live somewhere where they just don't have a used bookshop, which is pretty much the case for a lot of people now. But, you know, if you sign up to the right book accounts, you can see all kinds of publishers, bindings and interesting, you know, teaching materials, all kinds of interesting ephemera. I think that that has done a great deal, even though not all of those sites are about things directly for sale, although some of them are, but I think it's definitely done a lot to make people more conscious of the broader realm of material out there that they could engage in collecting if they wanted to. So another person has a question about the ethical issues of buying from people who don't know the market value of their items, such as garage sales, uh, whether buying as a collector or as a dealer. I can speak to the dealer side of that. Um, you know, the ethics for a dealer um, you know, are that if someone comes to you with something and they have no idea what it is and you know that it is valuable, you cannot just, you know, tell them it's not worth anything, we'll give you $10 for your trouble and then resell it. You know, that's really sleazy. You can't do it. Um, on the other hand, if I walk into someone's bookshop and they have it priced at $10, I feel like you are a bookseller. It was your job to figure out what you're selling. You didn't do it. I'm buying this. Like I, in that case, I feel no ethical pang. The garage sale thing is a trickier thing because that's someone selling something presumably for a price, but they don't know. I think that falls more into the first category. If I see someone selling something, and I mean, it's very rare that this has actually happened to me in real life where something genuinely valuable is being sold for, you know, $5 or whatever. I mean, I might just tell them, you know, this is actually maybe more special than you think it is. Maybe don't sell at the garage sale today. Maybe like take it to a dealer or, you know, take it to an auction house, that, that kind of thing. I do quite a bit of the buying for my collection at very local level, like flea markets, tag sales, especially in New Milford. And the nice thing is the value of anything that I might find is, is in its place in this collection. Very few pieces in this collection with maybe one or two exceptions are actually valuable on their own just for the general market. Um, and I'm always thrilled to tell people precisely why I'm looking to buy. And almost always people are more excited to talk with me about the history of New Milford and then contribute their piece um, 
neither, I don't think either, I'm not trying to get a, a steal of a deal and they're not trying to make a ton of money. We're more just excited to share the passion of like the story we're making together personally. Thank you. Do you think collecting is now forked into two kinds, one driven by lists and fame of the, and the well-known and the other based on the utterly personal such as ephemera? Why limit it to two? Yeah, two. I mean, there are literally so many, <laughs> so many kinds. Um, I, I will say that there is, I think, uh, maybe a tension that we're seeing now in the collecting world between a sort of older model of collecting, uh, you know, we, I mean, which at this point is, you know, 150 years old, you know, sort of Morgan, Huntington, Folger, sort of great collection model. Um, and the fact that so many people now have personal, interesting, um, and, uh, you know, historically significant, but not as Erica was saying in, you know, not piece by piece trophy kind of collections, instead mm -hmm. collections that gain their value from the entirety of the collection and the context that it's in. Um, I mean, I definitely try to emphasize with the prize and everything else that I do, the value and the excitement of the second model, just because I feel like the first model already has as much PR as it could possibly ever want. And so I just want to make people aware of other ways to think about the excitement of collecting. Do you all have a specific and favorite shop or catalogs that uh, are your go-tos? No one wants to reveal. <laughs> no one wants to reveal their secrets. I will, I will, I will say, um, I, a dealer who I completely admire and whose material I don't know when I will see again, you know, I guess until there's a vaccine is the German dealer, Daniela Kromp, who has uh, puts out the most extraordinary catalogs and has had the most amazing material at the New York Book Fair for the past couple of years. Um, and who does not have a website and you cannot buy from her online. And so, as I say, I have no idea when I'm going to get to buy anything from her again, but I always loved looking at her booth, and, you know, just in terms of, feeling lucky to see stuff that was so well chosen. I would say she's a big favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Erica or Peter? Peter, please. Sure, I was gonna say that over the you know, years that I've been collecting, the, the answer to that question has changed, but the two constants for me have been the Brattle Bookshop in Boston. Uh, George and Ken Gloss have always been gracious to me over the years and have a refresh stock. So it's not as if you're looking at the same books on each visit. And then also Doug Harding up in Maine on the Southern Maine coast was always an exciting place to visit in the summers with my family. And uh, Doug was always very eager to receive my father and me and found great things, you know, probably summer reading of people that went up to Maine. Uh, and so those would be two that I would single out. Thank you. Erica, do you have anything to add before we move on? Um, I just think um, for, the, for the purposes of this collection, probably I, I most appreciate any chances to shop locally in Milford. Not to say I haven't found really incredible pieces far outside of Connecticut, which is always like just a thrill at a, at a book fair, say in California or at a Vermont auction. I found one of my favorite pieces, a set of letters from one of the the grandson of the founder, founding families of New Milford at some incredibly unexpected Vermont auction. Oh. I happened to click on a listing that happened to be this. It was, the serendipity was amazing. Um, but any chance to get home and visit um, any of the local antique stores, the, the Historic Society when they do their annual tag sale, the local library sales are amazing. Um, so that's my primary favorite places. Do you think collecting in science and medicine is more or less immune to the forces being discussed here? Have you produced or are you working on a bibliography of your collections? Um, no. I'm asking both. No, no, totally not immune. Um, I mean, I would say that right now, like the market for classic scientific and medical high spots is through the roof, absolutely. And also there's enormous interest in like 
quack medicine, midwifery, all kinds of, you know, um, sort of vernacular home medicine and the manuscripts about it and the recipe books about it and all the ways that people took care of themselves when the medical establishment didn't, all of that material, which is often super cheap and kind of obscure and just hanging out around places. I think there's like, you can see a real fascination with that kind of, of um, quotidian medicine. Anyone working on a bibliography of their own collections? Erica, did you want to say a little bit about it? Just, I, I think if it's incredibly helpful to kind of have a sense at any given point, especially during when you're searching for new pieces, to have um, at least some basic reference of what's already in your collection to see if you if you find something that's related to a piece you already have, it might be uh, it might push you to to pick up a piece. Um, I think a bibliography, even just a rough bibliography, I think is incredibly helpful. Um, it's not necessary, certainly, but I just like being organized. So I think I think it's a useful tool for anybody collecting. Heather, this next one is for you. Do you think booksellers can add more? Do you think booksellers can add more value to ephemeral items through contextualization than they can to traditional collections? This is from Amber Korb. Well, I won't say more, but I think it's more important for booksellers who want to make money on ephemera to be able to provide really high quality research about the material. <laughs> um, because everyone is aware that this stuff is kind of out there and often can be picked up very cheap. What enables you know, someone who's a specialist in that material to charge the prices that they command is because they're bringing a whole context of that kind of, you know, what that is and what traditions is participating in and are able to really put it in historical context, often very specifically a classroom context. How would you use this? How, could, how would a university use this? How would a researcher use this? Um, and so I think that in a way it's harder to do that kind of material because if you do a fairly limited number of books, then, you know, I mean, every copy is different and you need to note the differences in every copy, but it's the same book that you've handled on multiple occasions. Whereas if you're constantly dealing with unusual one-off advertising signs for you know something then you have to throughout all of that constantly be renewing constantly be learning constantly be like writing new copy constantly really be um putting a lot of work into it and honestly i feel like that's the downside for dealers to dealing in all this unique material is that you put so much effort into cataloging something then it sells and you can't actually just go get another one, <laughs> like, you know, like it's over, it's done. Like now you have to write a whole nother essay about some whole other thing. So, um, so it's, it's more labor intensive. Yeah, definitely. Um, what advice do the panelists have about narrowing your focus or curiosity enough to make for a meaningful collection? Uh, this person seems interested in many things and it's hard to narrow focus in an impactful way. I mean, I think the great thing is that you don't actually have to make all the decisions at the very beginning. I mean, I think most collectors over the course of their career, they may start off in one place and as the collection evolves, realize that they're more interested in this other offshoot or that kind of thing. Like, I think it's about being honest with yourself about what your real interest is and what your real contribution to this material might be be what you really have an eye for instead of feeling like well I just have to pick up everything on this subject because that's my collection you know you don't have to you can you can allow I mean I think a lot of it is just giving people permission to have faith in their own responses to things and have you know having the capacity to say I seem to be interested in this kind of material all the time what is that telling me about myself and how might I develop this like how might I be more effective in doing this um, there's no problem with, I mean, limiting your curiosity, no one should limit their curiosity. You should be curious about everything, but most people do practically have to limit their collecting for reasons of time and space. So, um, so I would say, you know, go with the thing, even if it's not the most canonical or collected thing, go with the thing that you actually respond to the most profoundly and let that be your guide. And don't be afraid, you know, to say, actually this portion of the collection turns out not to be my primary interest. So maybe I'll deaccession that and use the money to buy stuff that, you know, cause now I'm onto this thing. That's okay. 
that's no failure. That's actually a sign of success. In that same vein, I think finding opportunities to talk about or write about your collection is a really great moment to pause and, and force yourself to say, what am I interested in and why? Um, I know for both of my collections started out very broadly and it wasn't until I sat down to start my bibliography or to write a letter about my collection that I said, ooh, wait, I actually, I'm specifically interested in either the social history or a certain time period or what have you. And it's not until you get a chance to, to speak with somebody that you have to organize it in your head. And I think it's very helpful to slowly start to impose limits on yourself because then you're, you're tightening your collection a little bit. It becomes more cohesive. And in a way that gives you more opportunity to then broaden it back out rather than shrink it down. It's also true that sometimes talking to someone about your collection, oftentimes someone who's not you can spot patterns that you mm. yourself can't. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that can be really helpful to have another pair of eyes on it. Yep. I think we have time for one more question. This is an interesting one. How can academics, authors, researchers, and scholars become aware of unique items in personal collections? Ooh. And right? it's a hard one because that's that's really for, uh, I mean, I love private collecting, but the thing, you know, the, the knock on it is, well, then this stuff just goes into people's houses and no one even knows about it. That's certainly not the case with a lot of private collectors who do enormous work to catalog and bring their collection to people's attention and to reach out to researchers, but some people don't. And the truth is, if you, if a private collector doesn't want to share, I mean, I don't believe that there is a way to compel disclosure on what it is that they have. Um, so I think probably the best thing to do is just to try to foster as many opportunities as possible for people to share um, with, you know, without feeling like they're, they're giving away something or whatever. Um, because ultimately, you know, you would like to see private collectors and institutional collectings working together in a harmonious ecosystem that makes scholarship deeper for everybody. Um, rather than, than um, having things just kind of disappear into a vault. And, and I wouldn't discount the service that collectors do to you know, take the trouble in their lifetimes to bring together material, to participate in events like this, to leave the things they collect to institutions so that way their research and teaching value can be explored by others. Uh, that can be done in your lifetime or after your death. Um, I think, but there is this overriding obligation that we, we need to collect for a purpose. And I think for a lot of us who collect, that purpose is to impart the passion that we have for the things we collect to others, uh, people like all of you. Uh, and then maybe at some point later in your life to leave the collection behind, either in the market so other people can enjoy the same passion you did, or at an institution where if your, your commitment might be to advance a scholarly point of view uh, to do that uh, instead. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists, to our moderator and host, Mary, and to all of the attendees today. Uh, we hope you'll take some time to visit the fair. It is open for another three hours. Uh, again, abaa.org slash VBF. And we hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.